Okay, um, it is 2.15, so um, we're going to go ahead and, and begin our, our second hour. And in the first hour, we looked back at developments that, that have happened in the past year. And now the second hour, we're going to look forward and in particular look at, look at two cases that are before the Supreme Court. The first one dealing with the waters of the, of the United States um, issue in the Clean Water Act. And, and we're also going to look at, at uh, California's Proposition 12. Our, um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our, our two speakers and so that uh, you can just transfer one, one to another when you, uh, when you get to that point in, in the program. Uh, our first speaker is, is Chloe Marie. Chloe is a research specialist for the, for the center. Chloe has worked for the, the center th for, uh, I believe, six years, and she started off doing research on, on energy issues, and she, she continues to do that. But within the last couple of years, she, she really has, has um, shifted her focus and is now looking at a lot of um, agricultural issues as well. The, the, the agricultural issue trackers that I directed you to in the first hour, I mean, Chloe is, the, is primarily responsible for the, uh, the content that is on those issue trackers. And so Chloe will talk today about the waters of the United States. And our second speaker is, is um, Audrey Thompson. Audrey is the newest staff attorney at the, at the center. She began with the center as a staff attorney in August of 2022. Prior to that, Audrey worked as a research assistant while she was um, getting her JD degree at, at Penn State Law. So she's worked with us for a number of years doing a, a, a number of things as a, as a uh, research assistant and then transitioning following her graduation from Penn State Law um, as a staff attorney. So um, Chloe and Audrey have, um, you know, each each done a tremendous amount of work for the center, and we're very pleased to uh, to hear them talk about these two issues before the Supreme Court. So Chloe, I will turn the floor over to you. Yeah, thank you, Russ. Uh, so today I will be talking about the waters of the United States uh, and the agricultural, but also environmental um, communities have been holding their breath uh, since early last year after the U.S. Supreme Court agreed to hear the case uh, Sackett versus EPA and finally settle uh, the million dollar question, what is the appropriate test for determining whether uh, wetlands or more generally surface waters, uh, all waters of the United States under the Clean Water Act? So how the government uh, should define waters of the United States has long been discussed uh, and also intensively litigated uh, in recent years. There is a long history of court decisions uh, that attempted to answer the specific issue. Uh, unfortunately, these decisions were not uh, clear cut and a lot of uncertainty remained uh, regarding the Clean Water Act jurisdiction over certain wetlands following the U.S. Supreme Court's uh, decision in Rapanos versus United States, and what test to apply uh, to make that juris uh, jurisdictional uh, determination. As a Justice Antonia uh, Scalia, uh, Continuous Surface Connection Test, or Justice Anthony Kennedy's Significant Nexus Test, uh, that should be the controlling rule of law. And in the meantime, we all heard, uh, I am sure, about the recent release uh, from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers of a new rule uh, redefining water waters of the United States. Um, so some take the position that the Biden administration should have uh, waited on the Sackett ruling to shape the rule, uh, but instead, the new rule came first. Uh, and we are all now wondering how things are going to play out with the U.S. Supreme Court, which decision is expected uh, later this year. So the Sackett case uh, is considered a test case to revisit uh, the definition of waters of the United States. And if it succeeds, uh, it would end years of regulatory efforts by each successive administration to construe um, Congress uh, intent when passing the Clean Water Act and what is meant by waters of the United States. 
But before we dive into the details of the Sackett case, uh, so currently before the US Supreme Court, uh, I would like to point out that this case could likely put an end uh, to years of changing the rule by each presidential administration. Um, the Clean Water Act protects waters of the United States. However, they are defined through regulation, uh, leaving the executive branch with much discretion in the way to formulate the regulatory details and geographic scope of federal jurisdiction over, uh, over surface waters. So um, the US EPA and the Corps have wrestled with defining waters of the United States. Uh, and there was quite a bit of controversy when in 2015, uh, at the end of the Obama administration, EPA promulgated a new definition, which was perceived as being much broader than the previous interpretation. And when a Trump administration came in, one of the first orders of business was to essentially reverse and change the definition issued under President Obama. Uh, ultimately, and in a very simplified way, uh, the Trump administration promulgated their own version of the definition. So now when President Biden came into office and through executive order uh, 13990, um, President Biden directed EPA and the courts um, to review once again the definition. Um, so the idea was to go back to the pre-2015 regulatory regime with updates uh, consistent with, uh, with US Supreme Court decision. Um, one thing that could prevent this game of ping pong between presidential uh, administrations was to have a case heard by the US Supreme Court to see if the court could provide a clear interpretation of what waters of the United States uh, mean under the Clean Water Act, which interpretation is the foundation for the, regula uh, for the uh, regulation promulgated. And the last time the US Supreme Court interpreted the meaning of waters of the United States was in the Rapanos case decided in 2006. So in Rapanos, the uh, US Supreme Court agreed on the outcome, but not the reasoning. Um, the US Supreme Court did not issue a majority opinion, but a plurality opinion with two different standards for determining, uh, determining jurisdiction. Justice Kalia um, considered that waters of the United States only comprised relatively permanent standing or continuously flowing bodies of waters, as well as wetlands, if one can show a continuous surface connection to other waters of the United States. On the other hand, uh, Justice Kennedy, in a concurrent opinion, held that such determination should be made on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis and wetlands must have a significant nexus to traditionally navigable waters and specify that a significant nexus exists when the wetland, either alone or in combination with uh, similarly situated waters in the region, significantly uh, affect the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of traditionally navigable waters. So the second case is a pivotal case uh, in that a majority opinion this time could provide a clear definition and end confusion within the executive and judicial branches. Um, so this is not the first time the second case has been before the US Supreme Court. Um, however, because we are limited in terms of time, we're not going to go over uh, the entire legal background of the case. But if you do want to learn more about it, uh, I strongly encourage you to check our issue tracker um, that is dedicated to the waters of the United States and located on our website. However, just a quick reminder of the facts here, um, private landowners, the Sackets, own a property near Priest Lake, Idaho, and uh, they begin construction of their home in April 2007. EPN, the corpse issued an um, administrative compliance order uh, interrupting construction after the agencies found that their building site contains wetlands adjacent to Priest Lake. So the agencies asked the Sackets to secure federal permission after determining that wetlands on their land or navigable waters protected under the Clean Water Act. 
they also asked for the site to be remediated or otherwise uh, the sackets would be subject to, to penalties. Um, so the sackets filed their lawsuit in April 2008. Uh, and following the ninth uh, circuit court's decision in favor of EPA, uh, which affirmed the use of the significant nexus test uh, and where the court agreed that the wetland on the Sackett's property um, had a significant nexus to Priest, uh, to Priest Lake and those fell under the Clean Water Act jurisdiction. Um, the Sackett's filed a petition for a writ of certiorari asking the US Supreme Court to revisit the Rapanos case uh, and provide a clear majority rule to govern the regulation of wetlands. Um, the circuits argued deep confusion over the significant nexus test and how it applies. So the US Supreme Court agreed to hear the case uh, and narrowed down the issue to whether the Ninth Circuit Court used a proper legal test for determining whether wetlands or waters of the United States. But more precisely, whether uh, the significant nexus test is the right method used uh, when it comes to, to wetlands. So the Sackets uh, suggested a two-step approach for determining EPA's jurisdictional authority over wetlands, much in line actually with Justice Kelly's uh, surface water connection test. So the first step would be for EPA to determine whether a wetland meets the definition of waters of the United States meaning whether there is a, um, a physical nexus between the wetland and the water of the United States, so much so that it would be complicated to show uh, where the wetland ends and where the water begins. And whether the water to which the wetland is physically uh, connected falls within the legal definition of traditional navigable waters, that is a stream, ocean, river, uh, or lake. Second, um, EPA ought to determine whether the, wa the, the water is of the United States, meaning whether it is subject to congressional authority under the Commerce Clause. And as you recall, uh, Congress may regulate the channels uh, of interstate commerce, which include navigable waterways. So the Sackett's main argument is that the significant nexus test expands the, the jurisdictional scope of the, uh, of the Clean Water Act. And by that, I mean the federal authority over navigable waters beyond the limits intended by Congress under the Commerce Clause. Um, so the Sackett's pointed out that Congress never clearly intended to regulate more than traditional navigable waters or interstate navigable waters that are linked uh, to interstate commerce or wetlands provided that they are physically connected to water of the United States. Um, they recognized that wetlands may be governed by the Clean Water Act. However, they argued wetlands can only be so if there is a direct a physical connection with waters of the United States. Um, and according to the Sackets, the test they proposed is far superior to the significant nexus test, which test they argue should be abandoned because it is very difficult to apply in real life and also raise 10 amendments concerns, arguing the test uh, takes away some state prerogatives over water protection, but also uh, raised uh, fairness and due process concerns for private landowners as getting appropriate federal uh, permission would uh, require them to pay a significant amount of money for legal advice and time consuming procedures, while also facing harsh fines and criminal penalties if they don't comply. So to sum it up, um, the Sackets believe the wetlands on their building site do not directly flow into water of the United States. And as a result, nothing they have done on that site can be linked to any channel of commerce. They are worried that without the proper list uh, in place, EPA would gain further authority to regulate bodies of water uh, that are not physically uh, connected to waters of the United States which could lead to dramatic uh, consequences for uh, private land owners. Uh, and in response, uh, in contrary to what is suggested by the Sackets, the, the US EPA argued that uh, the definition of waters of the United States includes adjacent wetlands, 
even though those are separated by a natural or artificial barrier from navigable waters. It can see road uh, in, in the case at end. Um, EP declared that it was Congress's intent to include adjacent wetlands under the definition of waters of the United States when amending the Clean Water Act in 1977. Uh, and court precedent shows that the US Supreme Court also interpreted the definition to include adjacent wetlands. Um, so EPA pointed out that a mere uh, barrier between navigable waters and adjacent wetlands is not enough to defeat EPA's jurisdictional authority over wetlands. It also noted the uh, particular importance of wetlands to protect the navigable water's integrity, which play a crucial role uh, in flood and, and storm control, but also help filtering pollutants and store water. As a result, the agency argued that a continuous surface connection uh, cannot become the sole basis for determining Clean Water Act jurisdiction and protecting the waters of the United States. According to EPA, the significant nexus test uh, allows adequate protection under the Clean Water Act of adjacent wetlands that would significantly um, affect the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of traditional navigable waterways. So EPA's position is that the wetland at issue in this case was historically part of a larger complex of wetlands from which water flowed directly into the lake and shallow subsurface flow remains. Basically, the significant nexus test accommodates the complexity of a situation better than the two-step um, approach and surface water connection test. So oral agreements were held last October, um, and it looked like none of the justices um, seemed convinced about the merits of the significant nexus test. Um, I have uh, included here a link um, to the oral arguments and transcripts, um, but to sum it up, Justice Gorsuch questioned uh, what EPA considers a reasonable proximity between a navigable water and adjacent wetland, uh, and how would a reasonable landowner um, have any idea um, as to what standard applies for wetland to be adjacent to navigable water? Uh, the Council for EPA admitted there were no bright line rules. Another point, um, one found negligent under the, the Clean Water Act criminal provision could face uh, imprisonment. And Justice Cavano called these provisions a red flag, given the vagueness of the significant nexus test. Um, also during questioning, it appeared um, some justices did not dispute the fact that adjacent wetlands fall under the definition uh, of waters of the United States. They rather questioned whether an adjacent wetland needed a direct physical connection to water of the United States. Um, some justices did not seem to think the significant nexus test uh, as presently applied would answer um, such, such um, a question. Uh, and Justices Sotomayor, Kagan, and Kevano even suggested the possibility of a third different test, something in the middle uh, for determining whether wetlands with no surface connection with traditional navigable waters fall under the definition um, of waters of the United States. Some justices may favor um, neither the significant nexus test, which may be a bit too broad, uh, nor the SACET's proposed um, two-step approach. Um, in the end, it seems all the, the justices uh, agree that some sort of balance is needed and potentially a third test to help establish that balance. So simultaneously, um, EPA has continued with the plan to amend the regulation to which it had previously committed before the US uh, Supreme Court agreed to hear the second case. And on December um, 30, 2022, so a couple of days ago, uh, EPA and the Corps published a final rule uh, purporting to revert to the pre-2015 regulatory regime governing the definition of waters of the United States. And according to EPA, the last decade, uh, the, the last decade plus uh, of regulatory and judicial interpretations of the definition of waters of the United States have resulted in ambiguity for the agricultural community and landowners, which justifies uh, a new final rule. 
So the, the good news is that the new uh, regulatory definition does not impact agricultural activities that are uh, statutorily exempt from Section uh, 404 permitting requirements under the Clean Water Act, such as for normal farming, silviculture, uh, ranching activities, construction of a farm or stock ponds or irrigation ditches or construction or maintenance of farm roads. Um, all exclusions from the definition in the pre-2015 regulations have been kept. Uh, the new rule, however, uh, codifies certain exclusions from the definition for clarity purposes, including the exclusion for prior converting cropland, which was initially included in the 2020 Navigable Waters Protection Rule. Uh, we know that prior converting croplands are excluded from the definition if the area is available for agricultural commodity uh, production. And EPA and the Corps have uh, interpreted the terms availability for agricultural commodity production as including crop production, haying, grazing, agroforestry, or yielding land for conservation use. Um, the agencies also define prior converted cropland consistently with USDA's uh, definition to avoid further confusion. Um, the new rule, however, added six new exclusions uh, from the definition, and it includes uh, certain ditches, artificially irrigated areas that would revert to dry land without proper irrigation, artificial lakes or ponds created on dry land, artificial reflecting pools or swimming pools created on dry land, water fill depressions created in dry land uh, incidental to mining or construction activity, and certain swells and erosion features. So what, what is interested is that EPA and the Corps, uh, the Corps are bringing back the concept of adjacency as understood in the pre-2015 regulatory regime that is bordering continuous or neighboring, with land separated from other waters of the United States by man-made dikes or barriers, natural river berms, beach dunes, and the like, uh, or adjacent wetlands. So the new rule also reads that when a wetland is adjacent to water that is not the water of the United States, to determine um, adjacency, the wetland must satisfy either the relatively permanent standard which is another name for Justice Kelia's uh, test, or the significant nexus standard. So this is a controversial aspect of the new rule. Um, EPA and the Corps came to the conclusion that it would be unreasonable to exclude the water from the definition simply and solely because it does not meet the relatively permanent standard. Uh, and as stated uh, in the rule, the significant nexus standard uh, refers to the test to identify waters that either alone or in combination with similarly uh, situated waters in the region significantly affect the chemical, physical, or biological integrity of waters of the United States. And for clarity purposes, EPA and the Corps defined um, significantly affect as meaning a material influence on the chemical, physical, or biological integrity of waters of the United States. And in order to define material influence, hydrologic factors such as the frequency, duration, magnitude, timing, and rate of hydrologic connections, including shallow subsurface flow, can be considered. So this is a big change in the sense that now even a shallow subsurface connection can be enough to show a significant nexus between wetlands and waters of the United States. Uh, on their website, EPA issued some additional guidance, including two fact sheets uh, providing guidance to the agricultural community and private landowners as to what the new rule means for them. Um, they are easy to read and will provide a good overview of the rules content. Uh, and I have included their links uh, here on the, on the uh, preview slide. Uh, and the new rule will become effective 60 days after it is published in the Federal uh, Register, which has not happened yet. Um, so to conclude this presentation, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, 
Many argue that EPA should have waited uh, for a decision from the US Supreme Court to ship uh, its new rule, but decided otherwise uh, and published it first. Um, so it is to be expected that the US Supreme Court will thoroughly review um, this new rule and its implications for private landowners and farmers. Um, however, it is difficult to predict what uh, their decisions will be. Uh, they may either come out with a similar position to, to EPAs or decide to create a new test uh, as suggested during uh, the oral arguments. But you can be sure that we will provide you uh, with the latest developments um, in our Agricultural Law Weekly Review, uh, as well as dedicated uh, issue tracker. Well, I have the uh, honor and privilege of uh, wrapping us up here. Um, uh, my name is Audrey Thompson. As Ross Piper mentioned, I'm a staff attorney with the Penn State Center for Agricultural and Shale Law. And I will also give a disclaimer. As Ross mentioned, I just started in August 2022. So I am also a newly licensed attorney. So if I say anything that makes me sound like I'm green, it's because I am. Um, but okay. I assure you that I have done extensive research on this topic. Um, and in fact, the last paper I wrote in law school was, was on this um, after the petition for certiorari had been granted. So um, hang with me and hopefully I'll tell you something maybe you didn't know. Maybe you know it all anyway, doesn't it? Okay, so I'm sure that most of you have at least heard about California's Proposition 12, but maybe not exactly sure what it says or what it does. Um, it actually starts back in 2008 with the passage of Cal California's Proposition 2, which prohibited the confinement of pregnant pigs, calves raised for veal, and egg-laying hens in a manner that does not allow them to stand up, lie down, fully extend their limbs, and turn around freely, otherwise known as the stand-up turnaround requirement. Then in 2010, the California legislature passed Assembly Bill 1437, which applied the stand-up turnaround requirement to the in-state egg sales beginning January 1st, 2015. And in uh, 2013, the California Department of Food and Agriculture issued a regulation establishing that birds be provided with a minimum of 0.81 square feet or 116 square inches of floor space. Both of these measures were challenged. Proposition 12 was, or sorry, Proposition 2 was challenged as too vague, and AB 1437 was challenged as a Commerce Clause violation by six states, Missouri, Nebraska, Oklahoma, Alabama, Kentucky, and Iowa. And both of those cases were dismissed, and then those dismissals were later affirmed. In fact, the challenge to the statute by the six states was dismissed. Um, so let's see, the, the six states, um, they didn't have standing. The economic harm that they alleged was necessarily speculative. And then um, that those cases or that case was also denied certiorari by the Supreme Court. So then in November 2018, 63% of California voters approved Proposition 12, which phased in new space requirements for egg laying hens, breeding pigs, and calves raised for veal, and prohibited the knowing sale of products derived from animals not raised in those space requirements. This is the big deal. Um, it also directed the California Department of Food and Agriculture to implement regulations to carry out that law. So, um, this chart here was published in 2018, and I thought it provides a pretty good um, uh, kind of layout of, um, so the current law at the time in 2018, there's that stand-up turnaround requirement. We see the phase in starting in 2020 of the uh, one square foot of uh, floor space for egg laying hens, and that was up from that 0.8. Um, and now we have the, the calf uh, raised for veal, 43 square foot of space. And then in 2022, we have full implementation of the whole law with the cage-free housing for eggs, 24 square feet of uh, floor space for breeding pigs, and then the, the calves raised for veal, the uh, floor space stays the same here. Um, and of course, we also have the in-state sales restriction uh, coming into play in 2022, which is really the underlying uh, Commerce Clause, what's really underlying the Commerce Clause challenge. I will also say at this point, I'm fully aware there's uh, many other states, Massachusetts, um, Colorado, that have these kind of egg laws. I'm not really going to talk about those. I know Ross did earlier because I'm, I'm just really focusing down on, on this case right here. So, um, in let's see, so the California Department of Food and Agriculture 
um, issued regulations on Proposition 12 in September 2022, and I'll get to the timeline on that in a second. Um, but currently, under those regulations, Proposition 12 applies to whole uncooked cuts of pork and bacon. It does not apply to cooked or ready-to-eat products, ground products, or combination food products that contain multiple ingredients like soups, sandwiches, pizzas, or hot dogs. Um, basically, to be exempt, the food just needs or needs to have ingredients other than uh, pork meat seasoning, curing agents, and, and things of that set, uh, nature. Additionally, pork is exempt if it's basically being shipped through the state and is not for in-state sale. Now, um, kind of, I don't want to say the first issue with Proposition 12, but a, a big issue with it, aside from any constitutional challenges that it invited, was that California Department of Food and Agriculture was, according to the statute, supposed to promulgate regulations to implement the law by September 1st, 2019. They did not do this. And even by January 1st, 2022, Proposition 12's full effective date, um, CDFA had, had not promulgated final regulations. At that point, I, I believe they'd issued some guidance. I know they had at least a proposed rule out, but they didn't have final regulations. And so that lack of final regulations was underlying this challenge from the California Hispanic Chambers of Commerce which they were basically saying, hey, you can't um, implement this law. There's How are we supposed to know how to, to obey it? Um, so it was challenging the state's ability to have the law go into effect without the implementing regulations. And this state, uh, this case is, I think, still technically going on a lot alongside the Supreme Court case. And so what's important or relevant here is that the California state court issued an order prohibiting the state from enforcing Proposition 12 until 180 days after the department, uh, California Department of Ag issues final regulations, um, which CDFA issued final regulations in September of 2022, which started that 180 day clock, which would have given California an implementation date of February 28th, 2023, which is coming up here very shortly. However, in light of the case pending in the Supreme Court, the parties have jointly stipulated that the law will not be enforced until July of this year, 2023. So quick review, um, Dormant Commerce Clause, Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution grants Congress the power to regulate commerce among the several states, which the Supreme Court has interpreted to mean that the states do not have the power to regulate interstate commerce, although states do have the power to regulate commerce within their own border, as long as they don't discriminate against other states. And I want to note here that there is a line of judicial thought, you're probably familiar with, that does not like this doctrine. It says the Constitution is silent on the Dormant Commerce Clause. Congress has the power to regulate commerce, so it's up to Congress to make laws preempting any state legislation if they don't want the states to regulate in this area. Um, but the courts have held up many in-state regulations based on their non-discriminatory nature, including a prohibition on petroleum refiners from also operating gas stations in Maryland, a statute requiring that 20% of the electricity sold in state must be from renewable sources in Colorado, and regulations requiring disclaimers about artificial hormone use in dairy products in Ohio. So the analysis for a law that is being alleged as a Commerce Clause violation asks two main questions. One, does the law discriminate against out-of-state commerce? Or two, and or two, does the law regulate extraterritorially? Um, in that first line of questioning, if a law does discriminate against other states, um, it's most likely going to be found uh, to be in violation of the Commerce Clause. It, the law usually doesn't have a lot of deference. Um, this, the court may take into consideration any safety or health concerns. I know there's a New York law that deals with the importation of firewood. Um, you know, those are kind of um, uh, rare circumstances. Um, and if it's not found to be discriminatory, then we go to the Pike balancing test, where we look at the local benefit versus the burden on interstate commerce and the law is invalidated if it places an undue burden under that Pike v. Bruce Church analysis. And uh, just quick reminder, that case was about cantaloupes. There was an Arizona producer growing cantaloupes and Arizona passed a law that said all the cantaloupes leaving the state had to be packaged a certain way. But that producer had a packaging plant across the state line in California. 
And so they were normally just shipping their stuff, you know, uncrated, having it packaged and shipping it back. And so that was the problem there. The courts there um, invalidated that law because basically what it would have required that producer to do was to build an in-state plant. And ultimately, I, I think you could almost argue that that was discriminatory because it was favoring in-state packaging. Um, but the court came up with the balancing test in that case. So then there's this other question of extraterritoriality or regulating commerce that occurs wholly outside of a state's border. And that principle has been used three times to strike down a state law in 1935, in 1986, and in 1989. In Baldwin, there was a New York law that regulated minimum milk prices to be paid to producers. And there, there was a dealer in New York who purchased some milk from a producer in Vermont at a lower price than that New York minimum price and then shipped the milk back into New York and sold it there. Um, the state of New York obviously went after that producer. The court in that case found that what that law was actually doing was regulating that uh, dealer's ability to, to deal completely outside of the state of New York. So it's not New York's business what the producer does with the Vermont, um, or it's not the dealer's, yeah, it's not New York's business what the dealer uh, deals with the Vermont producer. So that's a, a good example there of extraterritoriality. The other two cases, Brown and Healy, those are referred to as the price affirmation statute cases where both of the states at issue had laws requiring the entities at hand, um, liquor producers in one and beer shippers in another, to pledge that they would sell um, in state at prices no higher than their lowest out of state price, which again effectively restricted those sellers' ability to sell at a lower price. So if I've pledged to Connecticut that I will not sell, um, you know, lower than my lowest price out of state currently, which is maybe five dollars per unit, um, then it re restricts my future ability to turn around and make a deal with some other state for four fifty per unit. So the Supreme Court struck down these statutes in all three cases. Okay, so Proposition 12 challenges. After this uh, law was passed, it was um, it was challenged um, on two, two main entities here. And the first one was by the North American Meat Institute or NAMI in October of 2019. This challenge primarily focused on that first prong of analysis, that discriminatory argument. Um, NAMI said that Proposition 12 was discriminating against out-of-state producers who don't implement the square footage requirement. Their complaint was not very nuanced. It basically just reiterated the law. It alleged that the law was discriminatory. They mentioned extraterritoriality and they stated that it would burden commerce because producers will have to change their housing systems. Um, the district court dismissed that, the Ninth, court, uh, Ninth Circuit affirmed, and then the Supreme Court denied certiorari there. Then the National Pork Producers Council filed a complaint December 19th with a much more nuanced argument focusing on that extraterritoriality principle. So NPPC here really laid out some facts in their uh, complaint to support its claim of extraterritoriality, arguing that Proposition 12 violates the Commerce Clause because California does not have a large hog industry. So they state, um, that only about 1,500 out of California's 8,000 sows are used in commercial breeding. Um, and those 1,500 commercial sows may produce about 30,000 offspring per year, which is insufficient to supply the current in-state farm's annual capacity of 65,000 commercial hog finishing spaces. So, um, the, the amount of hog finishing spaces that exist in, in California, California doesn't even uh, produce that, that much. They're, they're shipping in hogs from out of state just to finish them in California. So they, they lay out these numbers. Um, MPPC also states that California's pork consumption makes up about 13% of the national market. And they say, accordingly, um, California's in-state sow breeding scarcely puts a dent in the demand for pork consumed in the state. The offspring of about 673,000 sows is required to satisfy California consumers' annual demand compared with the 1,500 that are commercially bred in the state. So um, this 
I, I think this is a much stronger argument than um, than than Nami and obviously um, it went to the Supreme Court. So anyway, in surprise, in response, um, of course, California's position that Proposition 12 only applies to in-state sales. So this is not regulating out of the state and that the law's requirements are not an excessive burden on commerce that would even warrant any kind of analysis. So as we know, this complaint was dismissed. Um, Ninth Circuit affirmed dismissal and then MPPC filed for a uh, petition for certiorari, which was granted in March of 2022. And I also want to point out here that we are still at the motion to dismiss stage. There has been no evidence in uh, collected in the record uh, for this case. So we're still just looking at uh, MPP's complaint and have they stated a cause of action um, under, under the Dormant Commerce Clause is really the question. So um, I thought this was kind of interesting, the difference between MPP's petition for writ of certiorari versus what they actually wrote in their brief. You can see here, they put that extraterritoriality principle described in the court's decision, um, asking whether or not that is dead letter. And the reason they did that is because uh, the both the lower courts stated that um, MPPC's claim of extraterritoriality um, was basically invalid because they the extraterritoriality only applies to these kind of price affirming or pricing statutes. And so this claim that um, where you have potential action going on like that just doesn't apply. Um, and they they took that out. I, I have, I'm not going to speculate why they did that, but California's question presented pretty straightforward. They're putting the onus back on MPPC to make their case. So did petitioners state a claim? So oral argument was held on October 11th, and it's probably noteworthy to mention here that there were four attorneys presenting arguments. There were two on each side. For California was Michael Mongan, the Solicitor General for California, and then uh, Jeffrey Lampkin for the Humane Society. And then for MPPC, um, there was uh, Timothy Bishop of Mayor Brown, who has also argued multiple environmental case laws at the Supreme Court, including cases dealing with the Clean Water Act. And I. Um, I looked up this morning whether or not he had argued on WOTUS and he didn't, um, although he is presented on WOTUS. So I thought, oh, maybe there's overlap, but there's not. Um, also for, on behalf of MPP's argument was Edwin Neeler, the Deputy Solicitor General on behalf of the United States, who has uh, filed an amicus brief, brief um, on behalf of MPPC. So during oral argument, of course, uh, many issues were raised by the justices. There's a lot of concern about how Proposition 12 could affect other state laws and basically whether or not um, this uh, upholding this law could be the new avenue through which states push their policy agendas across the country, which I, I believe is probably why um, the United States is is arguing in it and, um, and filing the amicus briefs. Um, so the issue of morality was raised by many justices, as you can see here. They're asking, what does morality mean? How broadly should it be construed? Can it be considered a legitimate state interest along with health and safety? Or should it be considered part of health and safety? And if so, how much weight should it be given? Um, I think also relevant here is Cal the argument that Proposition 12 is needed for the health and safety of California consumers has really not been pushed by California. California doesn't have good data on this and they've basically abandoned the argument. So they've been, I think pretty straightforward just saying like, this is what our voters wanted. So um, it's really more of a morality argument at this point, unless they were to present some evidence at trial. Um, so also there were a lot of worker issues raised as possible extension of morality. So if Proposition 12 is upheld, could a state enact a law based on the morality of a product's production that could in thing, uh, include things like whether or not the workers who produced it had union rights, minimum wage requirements, health care benefits, um, or the employees were in the country legally. Generally, the MPPC advocates were saying no to these questions. Morality is not a legitimate state interest as far as pike balancing is concerned, and that these types of labor issues um, shouldn't ta be taken into consideration as part of a a product's production. Um, California was saying that the the worker issues, they were distinguishing that from production. So they're just saying, you know, how much a worker makes or whether they have health insurance or whether they're in the country legally, that's just not even part of production. So if you if you went with our 
our argument, we don't even think that's production. Um, so there's that. Um, more kind of questions um, that were raised uh, were, were, were many. So could a total ban on a uh, product be a violation, sorry, could a total ban on a product of, uh, be a violation of the Commerce Clause under this expanded extraterritoriality doctrine? Because now you're just going to eliminate it from the market altogether. And so, for example, if California had just banned all pork right, all pork outright, would MPPC even still be arguing this case? There, the MPPC advocates were saying that a ban would be okay because it doesn't require an out-of-state producer to actually do anything. They're just going to lose market share. Um, I thought it was interesting that Justice Sotomayor really pushed on like the choice market decision argument um, against NPPC, she said, California is 13% 30, of the market. It's huge. But there are people who can sell there. They're already labeling themselves as crate-free or organic or, or whatever. What is the critical difference? How much of the market um, does the producers in Iowa have to control? And why does that make a difference? Because no one's forcing them to sell there. They can sell to any other state. Um, what's the line that we draw to say that this is an impermissible control by California of others when it's giving them a choice to say, sell my way or don't sell my way. If you want to sell my way, you can sell here. If you don't, you can sell in some other state. Um, and Alito kind of pushed back on that line of thinking with his questions um, on the potential chaos of kind of the market decides argument. Um, if Proposition 12 stands, could another state ban almonds that were produced with irrigation because they think it's immoral? And um, for uh, California, I think the answer to that would be yes. Um, so then we're really opening the door to kind of competing um, laws coming around the country there uh, under that analysis. Um, Justice Jackson focused on narrowing down the application of extraterritoriality. Um, NPPC was originally kind of saying that um, we should look at whether or not the state's regulation controls conduct outside the state's borders. But um, uh, Justice Jackson says she sees a narrower proposition that identifies that if a state conditions sales on an out-of-state business operating in a particular way, then that would be considered extraterritorial. Um, also, Justice Jackson was questioning whether or not, as part of that Commerce Clause analysis, the court should take into consideration um, the morality objective, if the morality objective were to be a legitimate state interest, as argued by California advocates, um, and then whether or not that morality objective could be accomplished another way. So if you have a state law and the state is saying, well, our citizens feel this way morally, then we would look at, well, is this law kind of like the least restrictive means to do this? And so in this case, the example there would be labeling. Um, California would require a label uh, saying that the meat is not, pork is not com compliant in these in these ways. And the MPPC advocates there seem to approve of labeling um, as in accordance with the Commerce Clause or in, as in accordance with their version of uh, extraterritoriality. And they did not consider labeling to be regulating out-of-state actors. Justice Barrett uh, pushed back on that, asking how requiring a producer to put a label on their product isn't regulating them. And MPPC advocates stated that it's a de minimis action. Um, you could put the label on its state. Um, and so I think this issue of labeling, uh, yeah, it's, um, I'm, I'm interested to see what will happen if that even becomes a part of the opinion or the analysis. Um, Roberts and Alito asked questions about the size of the state or the industry and like how that plays into the analysis. So California is a big populous state. There's a lot of economic incentive to sell there. Would they still be having this conversation if Rhode Island or Wyoming had enacted a Proposition 12? Um, and there was also a discussion of at what point does the size of the industry in the state basically collapse all of this into just a plain discrimination analysis. So if California had 50% of the nation's hogs is requiring the sale of pork to comply with their own in-state housing requirements, really now just an issue of discrimination against out-of-state pork. Um, and last but certainly not least, there is the anti-dormant 
anti-dormant commerce clause crowd who say that this doctrine shouldn't even exist in the first place. It's judge created. This is Congress's job. Um, if Congress thinks that California is overstepping its bounds, Congress should pass a law addressing it. It's not the court's jobs. Um, who did I say there? Um, yeah, Kavanaugh, Gorsuch, Alito asked questions like, well, can't Congress just pass a law? There was a lot of that. So in summary, MPPC is asking the court to expand the extraterritoriality doctrine to basically state that if a state action somehow requires that out-of-state producers or actors modify their operations um, or their effects, then I, the way I'm kind of reading this and the what I think they're arguing is that that might would essentially just trigger a commerce clause um, analysis, and then courts would have to take into consideration like a balancing test and look at justifications. So it would be like another way to throw it into pike analysis, I suppose. Um, we'll see what the court comes up with. California maintains that Proposition 12 is not a violation, that it only regulates in-state sales and that the morality or desires of the citizens who voted into law should be given full accordance. So um, I'd like to leave you with, I'm, I'm hoping this works. If it doesn't work, then I'm going to abandon it quickly. Um, so I guess I would have to turn on. Oh, well, I think I'm going to just abandon this because I don't know if I can get this to work. Well, I sliced together a little piece of last piece of the oral argument um, or the rebuttal on behalf of MPC, um, which I think is, is very, um, very good. And the uh, lawyer there kind of brings back the purpose of the Commerce Clause, which is um, to prevent balkanization and unify national commerce. And ultimately, kind of um, all of all of this discussion, like that, you know, went on for two hours or such. Like we have to always kind of go back to the purpose of this law, and is upholding Proposition Twelve is that consistent with the purpose of of the Commerce Clause in the first place? And MPC is saying no. Um, and then also that uh, lawyer reminded the court that the case is still in the motion to dismiss stage, which also plays a part in the analysis because uh, there is no evidence in the record. So um, with that, I invite you to uh, find this PowerPoint, listen to this little uh, snippet that I, I stitched together. I took out all the ums and uh, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Audrey, uh, for that for that presentation. Um, do we, if we have any questions, I don't see any questions in the, uh, in, in the Q and A, but if anyone has any questions on, um, on the, this proposition 12 litigation or on, on WOTUS, um, the, uh, the rule or the litigation, please, please post those into, uh, um, into, into the chat. And I guess, um, you, are you going to try this again, Audrey? Yeah, nah, I don't think I think I could spend another like six minutes trying to make sure this is going to work. And oh well, that's what I get for not trying it beforehand. Okay, okay. Um, and of course, I mean, with the Supreme Court, we really don't have a sense for when um, when they're going to decide. I mean, it, on either of these cases, Audrey or Chloe. I mean, have you did you get any indication um, when to expect a decision? I mean, for the waters of the United States, not really, especially since the new rule uh, was released. You know, we can only assume that the U.S. Supreme Court is going to take the time to to read through that and uh, possibly, you know, after after the, their term. Uh, but who knows? And, and Audrey, same. I guess it's, the, it's yeah. the same. I mean, we never, yeah, unless you have some inside source, you really don't know when that when that opinion is going is going to uh, to drop. Um, there is there is a question about the uh, why isn't the WOTUS case moot due to the new EPA rule? Um, well, I guess because the I don't know for me the new I mean it's my opinion but the new EPA rule doesn't really um, provide an answer for the issue presented in front of uh, the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, they, they're not related in a sense, um, you know, so I guess the question before the U.S. Supreme Court is still very much valid. Uh, Focused on the statute 
the statute itself, right? I mean, yeah. the, the, the litigation is focused on the statute, which, I mean, obviously that's where both, both um, originate, but, um, but yeah, somewhat, somewhat distinct. Um, okay, so I want to thank if we I don't see any other any other questions. Um, I want to make sure that um, that, you know, we encourage you all to uh, to participate with us again on on Thursday um, for a discussion of agricultural antitrust, as well as a discussion of uh, of of pesticides and the, and the Chesapeake Bay. We also have and I should have had this this calendar right in front of me, but we we have our dairy, um, our quarterly dairy webinar is next, it's next Tuesday, isn't it, right? Isn't that when it is, Audrey or Chloe? 17th. The 17th, yes, yeah, so next Tuesday. So we have a, a webinar each quarter that we focus on dairy developments over the past quarter. So that uh, quarterly update is next Tuesday, and that will address uh, legal developments relevant to the dairy industry that occurred October, November, and, and December of... Uh, of, of last year. So we have we have that webinar next Tuesday and then the following Friday, I believe, is our um, understanding ag uh, the basics of ag finance. That's January 27th. So those two um, so we have the the, uh, the 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 day two of the farm show symposium this week. and then in the following two weeks we have a, a dairy webinar as well as our, under, understanding our the basics of ag finance. So we encourage you to to uh, join us for for those webinars over the next few weeks. So with that, I think um, we'll go ahead and close out our webinar for today. So once again, thank you very much for for participating. <laughs>